Well, over here again uh, from the last time, which has been a while ago, but uh, I do want to talk a little bit in a, for a short period of time about uh, the book I'm writing. I'm really finished with it uh, and probably hit the market in a short period of time. Uh, and you'll find about, out about it. I'm doing several book signings actually across the state. Uh, but the title of the book, I got a rough look at it. It's called The Alamo, The Cradle of Lies, Slavery, and White Supremacy. And <clears throat> what I try to do in the book is um, go through all of the things that have been said about the Alamo that are factually untrue. And <clears throat> several books have already been done, probably the gold mine uh, most recent books in 2010 was by Dr. Philip Tucker, uh, who wrote a book called Exodus from the Alamo, The Anatomy of the Last Stand Myth. And the one after that, more recently, was Forget the Alamo, in which the things that we normally think were factual are, total, factual are totally untrue. Um, they, in fact, got much of their documentation from primary source documents. Um, and if you haven't read the primary source documents, then you're just fishing in the dark. Uh, one of the, <clears throat> the best ones is by Todd Hansen called The Alamo Reader. It's about, it's huge, 900 pages. Um, and what he did <clears throat> was he put it in all the newspaper accounts, all the uh, verbal accounts of what people said uh, happened at the Alamo, during the Alamo, and after the Alamo. Of course, no one survived uh, the Battle of the Alamo except the 19 people that were let free. Uh, and so there really was no one to tell the story unless you're going to believe Travis a slave or you're going to believe uh, Dickinson, uh, Susanna Dickinson's story. And then you got to keep in mind that um, Travis a slave, and the problem I have with it calling him Joe the slave, that's totally disrespectful. <clears throat> he had a last name. Apparently, Travis didn't want his last name attached to his slave, so Joe is never called Joe Travis. The interesting part about that I do in, in my book is I look at the ancestry of Joe and discover that he had a brother named uh, Wells Brown, William Wells Brown. Now, he got his last name, Wells Brown, because he was a runaway slave and he wound up running from house to house, farm to farm, trying to get away. And he just luckily uh, ran up on a Quaker family that took him in. And the name of that family was Wells Brown. <clears throat> so in thanks to uh, the person that hid him out from the slave catchers, um, he, named his, he took on the last name of Wells Brown. Now here's the interesting part. William Wells Brown, the brother of Joe, quote, the slave, their mother was the offspring of Daniel Boone. Um, Daniel Boone was, you can well imagine, he was, he, he killed Native Americans for a living, <clears throat> believed in genocide, he was a racist fellow. Um, and, and there is some reports to indicate that he probably raped the, the mother of uh, Joe the slave. So, um, but uh, what's interesting is none of this is known by most people because uh, it's been pretty much hidden over the years. And so it's an important piece of history that needs to be talked about and discovered. Um, the, the, the thing about doing history from primary source documents it involves more than Googling. Um, Googling, if all you're doing is Googling, you're not doing solid research. Um, Googling is nice for starters. It's not solid research, however. Solid research involves going and looking at the primary source documents in which they may or may not be on the internet. You may have to go to a library or a museum, and even going to a museum is not often not the best place to go um, unless there's a lot of primary source documentation there. You're not gonna learn about solid history by looking at the museum pieces on the wall that only have captions about that big that only tell a piece of the story and not the big picture. So I always make the argument that looking at an elephant um, with a microscope misses the whole elephant, uh, misses the elephant, that, uh, the, the environment the elephant grows in. Um, so it's always good to look at history with a microscope. It's also important to look at it, zoom out, zoom in, zoom out, zoom in. So that's what I've tried to do uh, with this particular book. Um, and I, what I do is talk about the lies that have been told, the stories that are totally false, uh, 
<clears throat> the fact that slaves were sold at the Alamo. There is obviously documentation to prove that. In a light newspaper interview done in 1917, uh, one of the men who guarded the Alamo uh, when the Confederacy was in charge of it in 1861, he was asked a question by a reporter, does the Alamo look any different now? And what he meant by now was 1917. Does the Alamo look any different now, 1917, uh, uh, than it did when you were guarding it, 1861? And he said, oh yeah. Um, there were some stairs on the side of the front of the Alamo, the icon iconic front, which by the way, didn't exist. That was added later, but the so-called iconic front. Um, he said there's some stairs on the side and you would go up to the second floor and that's where slaves were sold. Um, and he mentioned how much slaves cost. <clears throat> they, they varied from, depending on how much skill a slave had. Uh, just a slave that worked in the field, anywhere from 600 bucks to 800 bucks. A slave that knew how to shoe horses or, or do blacksmithing could come as high as $3,000. So, um, so these things are generally not discussed. Nor is um, the fact that Sam Houston owned at least 12 slaves uh, during different periods of his life. And many, a few of them did escape uh, to go to Mexico. That's not talked about very much either. Nor is it discussed that Sam Houston's position on the war with Mexico, there are two wars with Mexico, 1836 and 1846. First war with Mexico was the Battle of the Alamo and San Jacinto. All kinds of myths and lies and stories are just simply not true because the people that were telling these stories were mostly newspaper hucksters, meaning they were trying to make money uh, by selling stories to the general public that they invented that they didn't actually get from primary source documents from interviews with people, they didn't get them that way. They made, made men, much of this stuff up. The comment about a line being drawn in the sand that those want to stay and fight, you know, cross the line, those that don't, whatever the case may be, that story was made up by William Zuber, who was always making up stories during that particular period of time. He, he was out to make money and not tell the truth. So these are some of the things I address uh, in uh, my book and how white supremacy when people talk about manifest destiny, they often mention that only within a certain frame. It, it was more than conquering the country from the East Coast to the Pacific Coast using God as the excuse to conquer the country. Uh, manifest destiny was also racial or racist destiny. So the two go together. So I don't like to just use the term manifest destiny. I, I also combine it with racist destiny. Uh, because that's what the whole thing was all about. Removing Native Americans from their homelands, which is what Andrew Jackson was doing. And at the same time, he had a plan. And the plan was remove Native Americans, primarily Creek, Cherokee from Alabama and other places in the South. Remove them. Eventually, they, do, they are removed along the Trail of Tears. Those that won't leave are killed, murdered, etc. And he has a plan. Let's get rid of all of the Native Americans then we can uh, expand the institution of slavery from coast to coast. That's Andrew Jackson's plan. And working with him on that plan, most people don't know it, Sam Houston was a good, good friend of Andrew Jackson. So was David Crockett. They both fought at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, uh, in which they destroyed the Creek and Cherokee Indian resistance. And, and so they brought those ideas into Texas. Interestingly, those Creek and Cherokee Native Americans, some of them wound up in Texas as immigrant Native Americans. And of course, Sam Houston used them to his benefit because there were two bands of Cherokees, uh, two bands of Creeks, one, at least two. Cherokees probably had five, but there were at least two major ones. And one group was called Red Sticks, the other group called White Sticks. The White Sticks, you could make the argument, those were the Uncle Tom Native Americans because they supported Andrew Jackson in the war to annihilate their own people. The Red Sticks are the ones, Cherokees, who fought against Andrew Jackson and Sam Houston. So when someone says, well, Sam Houston was a friend of Native Americans, a friend of the Cherokee, that's not the whole story. You always have to ask the question, really, which band? White Sticks or Red Sticks? Well, it was the White Sticks. So. They leave out these details of history so that they can then be written in such a way 
as to glorify the institution of white supremacy, white racism, and this has been the, the birthmark of, of, the, of this country. S this country was born with three political birth defects. And I say political birth defects. A racial birth defect, a gender birth defect, and what else? A class birth defect. And it's evidenced by the fact that in the beginnings of this country, only white men with property could vote. There's the white, there's the racial birth defect, men, the gender birth defect, and third, class birth defect, you had to own property. Or you couldn't vote. You had to be a white man with property. And that's how, that was the, the model for the establishment of America. Um, and of course, while this is being established, Thomas Jefferson, slave owner, he owned quite a bit of slaves. Uh, that story is not told. And all of this kind of thinking, this white racialized mode of thought, actually controls the entire country. It still does, in my opinion, uh, controls the country. And that's why we have the resistance movements, that's why we have Black Lives Matter, because black lives never mattered. White lives always mattered. So this is the, the thing that we're, we were left with from several hundred years ago that's still a problem. And it kind of embodied itself in the understanding of what took place at the Alamo. All of the men who fought at the Alamo were slave owners or pro-slavery men. They leave that out of the history book as if it shouldn't be talked about. Uh, and, and, and Benjamin Lundy, who was a white abolitionist who lived during that period, he said that the Battle of the Alamo and the fight for Texas independence was a slave owner rebellion. It wasn't a battle for freedom against the dictatorial Santa Ana. So I'm going to expose all of that stuff. By the way, everywhere Santa Ana went, and the primary source documents prove that, he freed black slaves wherever he went. Well, you can well imagine, well, he became the biggest villain in the history of Texas if he was doing that. And, um, and this is evidence of the slave revolt that took place on the Brazos River. When they heard Santa Ana's troops were approaching the Brazos, there was a big slave uprising on the Brazos because they knew they would be freed if Santa Ana was able to conquer that, uh, a win at that particular battle. So this, this is totally untold. It's been erased like a giant eraser. Uh, they've erased it from history books. You don't learn that in high school. They're not gonna tell you that in high school. It's just continuation of one racial myth after another. Crockett, by the way, when he fought the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, uh, Andrew Jackson's troops, they were mainly racist militias from the South. All of these slave-owning states, and even the Northern ones to some degree, had militias that were used to kill Native Americans. So Andrew Jackson brings his militias over into Alabama to kill Creek and Cherokee Indians. And when they do, he allows his troops, when they kill women who are pregnant, Native American women, the baby is drug, dragged out of the, the womb, and they use these corpses to decorate their horses. Sam Houston was there when they were doing that. Davy Crockett was there when they were doing that. These men could hardly be called heroes. Well, you could call them killers and murderers for sure. But these are the guys that are enshrined in this understanding of what the Alamo is all about. David Crockett, slave owner. Jim Bowie, slave owner. He was one of the worst, by the way. Uh, he was a very shrewd man. Um, he wanted to marry a <coughs> so-called Tejano, in which he did, uh, named Veramende. Uh, and, and look, Tejano in those days didn't mean Tejano like it means now. Tejano in those days meant white. So his wife was white because the Spaniards considered themselves white after they totally erased their Moorish North African ancestry. So in telling people that they're part Moorish, this comes as a surprise if they have Spanish last names. For example, Alvarado starts with A-L. It's the result of the Moorish invasion of Spain. A-L comes from what? Allah. So the two languages, Latin and Arabic, are combined so that the spellings indicate the influence of the Arab North African influence in Spain. If your last name is Rodriguez, for example, with an EZ, that indicates you have an Arab North African relative, whether you like it or not, because this is the combination, speaking linguistically, of the two languages that went together. Gonzalez with an EZ, you have an Arab relative. There is no doubt about that. And then if your last name is Moreno, oh my God, think about that a minute. Moreno, 
the Moors invade Spain. What if your last name is Morales? Oh my, I guarantee you, you have a black Arab or, or Islamic relative because of your last name indicates that. You have to remember, people didn't have last names at one time. They, they were associated with place names, occupations. So if your last name was Carpenter, I guarantee you, you have a, a person in your family who was a carpenter. Last name Fields, yet someone owned some fields or worked the fields. Miller, they grinded up stuff. It's the same with the last names in Spanish. They indicate, in Spain's case, they indicate Arab North African ancestry. Moreno indicates more of an African, direct African ancestry, because the Spanish had this system of slavery that they judged by skin color. So if you were Moreno, you were a little bit darker than a Prado, or, uh, or a little bit darker than a mulatto, and these are all terms that the Spanish use. A lot of people think the term mulatto is French. No, it's not Spanish. The Spanish were in control of Louisiana way before the French. So, and the French adopted the term mulatto. So these racial terms that the Spanish invented came into Mexico, and this is the kind of system that they had. So, and they had a birth certificate book. I'll cover that in the book. If you were Spaniard, you were considered pure white, but not really because there's no such thing as any pure anybody. There's no such thing. The DNA shows that. There's no such thing. Nobody's pure. So how could these Spanish people claim they were white? Well, they erased their North African ancestry. They Hispanicized. We often talk about Anglo-sized. They Hispanicized their last names and, and, and other names as well. The domes that you see in the Middle East, they have a religious meaning from Omega, Alpha to Omega, the realm of God. That's why the Arabs built the domes. Well, guess what? They build these domes all over Spain, except when they're conquered in uh, 1492, the Spaniards place a cross on top of the dome to indicate we've conquered you. So these domes in itself are an indication of Arab architecture that was passed on into our part of the world and even into places like the Alamo. So. The book deals with a lot of this stuff that people don't know about. It's very important. And I try my best to give the primary source documentation from the, the existing documents uh, and the parts that are totally ignored. If you want to know the his truth about history, you look at what they don't want to talk about, and that'll give you a clue of what you ought to be talking about. And so we're going to be trying to do that in the book, which will be released soon. The Alamo, a cradle of lies, slavery, and white supremacy. Thank you for tuning in.